Kamala Harris at a rally in North Carolina finally unveiled a few economic policies in a 27-minute speech devoted podcaster that I am. I watched the whole thing and I cut together about five and a half minutes worth of the policy points uh, so that we don't have to read them. We will watch them. So we're going to full screen this and we are going to play this video. These are her economic policy points. This is about five and a half minutes. It feels like three and a half hours, uh, but it is only five and a half minutes. <laughs> So we'll full screen this, and we will see you back here in five and a half minutes uh, to talk about this a little bit. Together, we will build what I call an opportunity economy. An opportunity economy. So in the weeks to come, I will address in greater detail my plans to build an opportunity economy, and today, I will focus on one element that's on the minds of many Americans as they pay their bills at the kitchen table or walk the aisles of a grocery store. And that is lowering the cost of living. We all know that prices went up during the pandemic when the supply chains shut down and failed. But our supply chains have now improved. And prices are still too high. A, lo a loaf of bread cost 50% more today than it did before the pandemic. Ground beef is up almost 50%. Many of the big food companies are seeing their highest profits in two decades. And while many grocery chains pass along these savings, others still aren't. Look, I know most businesses are creating jobs, contributing to our economy, and playing by the rules. But some are not. And that's just not right. And we need to take action when that is the case. At And I will work to pass the first ever federal ban on pr price gauging on food. My plan will include new penalties for opportunistic companies that exploit crises and break the rules. And we will support smaller food businesses that are trying to play by the rules and get ahead. Sorry, we're going to play the rest of this. I just I had to butt in here. You could tell how empty she is. She doesn't even really understand her own policy. It's price gouging, not price gauging. No. <laughs> gouging is the is the that's the predatory practice. Not 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 price evaluation. But you know, that's what gauging would be. No, price gouging. That's that's the script there. But Damn hey, she's even better slut. than Biden. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Hey, it's a better read than Joe Biden. Got to give her that, right? Well, she 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 didn't she didn't say that she finally beat Medicare. So yeah, far. Right, exactly. Yes, a low so bar to clear, far. but yes. well done. All right, here we go. Two months ago, I announced that medical debt will no longer be used against your credit score. And I will work as president with states like here in North Carolina, Roy Cooper, thank you again, to cancel medical debt for more and more, millions more Americans. As president, I will work in partnership with industry to build the housing we need both to rent and to buy. We will take down barriers and cut red tape, including at the state and local levels. And by the end of my first term, we will end America's housing shortage by building three million new homes and rentals that are affordable for the middle class. And, and we will make sure those homes actually go to working and middle class Americans. Not just investors. Because, you know, some corporate landlords, some of them 
buy dozens if not hundreds of houses and apartments. Then they turn them around and rent them out at extremely high prices. And it can make it impossible then for regular people to be able to buy or even rent a home. Some corporate landlords collude with each other to set artificially high rental prices, often using algorithms in price-fixing software to do it. It's anti-competitive and it drives up costs. I will fight for a law that cracks down on these practices. So in addition, while we work on the housing shortage, my administration will provide first-time home buyers with $25,000 to help with the down payment on a new home. Finally, there's one more way I will help families deal with rising costs, and that's by letting you keep more of your hard-earned money. Under my plan, more than 100 million Americans will get a tax cut, and we will do this by restoring two tax cuts designed to help middle class and working Americans. The Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. Millions of Americans with children got to keep more of their hard-earned income. We know this works and has a direct impact on so many issues, including child poverty. We know it works. So as president, I'll not only restore that tax cut, but expand it. We will provide $6,000 in tax relief to families during the first year of a child's life. All right. All right. Well, you know, it was predictable what certain outlets would have to say about that, i.e. New York Post. Communism <laughs> Paris unveils budget breaking one point seven trillion dollar economic plan. It's one point seven trillion over a decade, by the way. The military budget, by the by the time those 10 years are over, will probably be about $1.7 trillion a year if it keeps growing at this rate. Exactly. That includes government price controls. All right. So you could expect that from the New York Post. But here is the perfect illustration uh, of the hypocrisy of liberal class media. Uh, an outlet like the Washington Post has been, you know, along with the New York Times, you know, just sounding the alarms about the threat of fascism and authoritarianism and totalitarianism coming from Donald Trump and God forbid he should become the next president and they, you know, that's it for the country. So you so they're in the tank for the Democrats and they they show that just about every chance they get. Like just about every chance they get to write a puff piece about Kamala Harris or you know whoever the Democrat du jour is who we're supposed to rally behind. Uh but just the faintest whiff of economic populism. And by the way, she's not going to do any of those things. Um we we've been fooled once on that in the past. Fooled many times. Most recently was Joe Biden's speech when he won his big Build Back Better speech where he laid out everything he wanted to do and, oh, this would be great. So it turned out he did absolutely none of it. Didn't even negotiate with Joe Manchin to try to do any of it. So I'm not suggesting that you get your hopes up. But a rhetorical gesture towards a very sort of neoliberal and bureaucratized version of economic populism draws the following from the editorial board of the Washington Post. The Times demands serious economic ideas. Harris supplies gimmicks. So they pan this speech, even though Donald Trump is at the gates, right? Still, nah, maybe, you know what? Maybe Orange Hitler, not so bad. Not so bad when the alternative is $25,000 in down payment assistance on a new home. Vice President Kamala Harris's speech Friday was an opportunity to get specific with voters about how a Harris presidency would manage an economy that many feel is not working well for them. 
Of course, those many are not readers of the Washington Post, so we have to trash this as much as we can. Unfortunately, instead of delivering a substantial plan, she squandered the moment on populist gimmicks. If Russell were back in in his apartment, I would have had him do the Marquis de Dobular uh, costume and makeup and, and read I, I swear to God, when I read it, I was like, if I were back in New York, I would definitely do a Marquis de Dobular for yeah, this. Exactly. Uh, it, it's called for. Americans are clearly still anxious and angry about the high cost of groceries, housing, and even $5.29 Big Macs, if you're the kind of American who would eat a Big Mac, while the inflation rate has cooled substantially since well, the 2022 we're boycotting peak. McDonald's. Well, yeah, I mean, we are not eating it anyway, but I'm saying yeah. even a Big Mac is too expensive for the... For the peasants now, uh, while inflation has cooled substantially since the 2022 peak, an ostensible Biden-Harris administration accomplishment, prices remain elevated to uh, relative to the Trump years. So it's a real political issue for Ms. Harris. One way to handle it might be to level with voters, telling them that inflation spiked in 2021, mainly because the pandemic snarled supply chains and that the Federal Reserve's policies, which the Biden-Harris administration supported, are working to slow it. The vice president instead opted for a less forthright route, blaming big business. Oh, my God, you don't say The business of America is business. Yes. Blaming big business. Oh, my God. I mean, that sentence there. So what they say, one way to handle this devastating political issue might be to level with voters and say, hey, we're working on bringing it down. Is it coming down? No, prices aren't going down. They keep going up at slower rates than before. So we're working on it. Instead, she blamed big business. Who, if they're suffering from crippling inflation at the grocery store, would be satisfied with the former answer, the one that the Washington Post suggested, which is, hey, we're doing a great job, right, already, and it's just going to be slow. Deal with it. Again, the normie voter who reads the Washington Post, that's fine. They're fine. They can afford to pay a few dollars extra for a loaf of bread once or twice a week at the grocery store. Money all your life. Exactly. But the vice president opted for a less forthright route is to blame big business. She vowed to go after price gouging by grocery stores, landlords, pharmaceutical companies, and other supposed supposed corporate perpetrators by having the Federal Trade Commission enforce a vaguely defined federal ban on price gouging. Never mind that many stores are currently slashing prices in response to renewed customer bargain hunting. No, McDonald's brought back a $5 meal to get people back in the store. Prices are still up. Prices, I mean, like, who, who does this, which, like, who which reads they, this? they said is temporary. Yeah, well, yes, that they've said is temporary. It. Right, right. Just to get you that fix so you don't lose, you know, so, so, so you don't, you're so, not so away you for too long. healthy or something. Right. They don't want to get you in a pattern of healthy eating. They want to keep they, they you hooked on the start sugar. Liking apples and stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Miss Harris, I love this line. Mrs. Harris, uh, Miss Harris, pardon me, says she'll target companies that make excessive profits, whatever that means. Whatever that means. It's hard to see how groceries, a notoriously low margin business, would qualify. Thankfully, this gambit by Ms. Harris has been met with almost instant skepticism, with many critics citing President Richard M. Nixon's failed price controls from the 1970s. Whether the Harris proposal wins over voters remains to be seen. But if sound economic analysis still matters, it won't. Hey, uh, Washington Post, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like you want Trump to win. It sounds like you're helping Trump. Yeah. It's Why actually are you really, helping Trump? This just helps Donald Trump. This just helps what, Donald Trump. What are you thought, voting for Trump? Yeah, what are you voting for Trump? Exactly. I thought Trump was the new Hitler. I thought he was an existential threat. No, what's actually the existential threat to the Washington Post is uh, people getting a $25,000 boost from the government when they make a down payment on the house. Like, no matter what they say about Donald Trump, when the rubber hits the road, and this, the liberals will always choose fascism over socialism. Always. Yes. Every time. Yes. No matter what yes. they say, no matter how they... Ver- and this isn't even socialism. This is like bureaucratized neoliberalism. Right? That's it. But even it's, this it, is too it, much for it's, this. It's, it's, it's please don't drag us out of our houses and march us up a scaffold. Right. We're going we're gonna to do <laughs> exactly. something for you. Exactly. That, that is all this is. 
No, this is who they are. And this is, I pulled this up. I was going to send it to you, but I'll just read a little from friend of show, Thomas Frank, who's come up quite a lot. He did a masterful article that if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend. He did this after the 2016 race, very shortly after, um, called SWAT Team. It was in Harper's. And it was about specifically, he said, this is about how the media covered Sanders in general. But for purposes of the article, I'm going to focus on the Washington Post. And he just okay. focused on the way they covered him. So this this is part of his summation after he breaks down all the exceptions that they took to Sanders. Think of all the grand ideas that flicker in the background of the Sanders denouncing stories I have just recounted. There is the admiration for consensus, the worship of pragmatism and bipartisanship, the contempt for popular outcry, the repeated equating of dissent with partisan disloyalty, and think of the specific policy pratfalls, the cheers for TARP, the jeers aimed at bank regulation, the dismissal of single-payer health care as a preposterous dream. This stuff is not mysterious. We can easily identify the political orientation behind it from one of the very first pages of the Roger Tory Peterson Field Guide to the Ideologies. This is common seaboard centrism. It's markings of complacency and smugness as distinctive as ever. It's habitat, the familiar beltway precincts of comfort and exclusivity. Whether you encounter it during a recession or a bull market, its call is the same. It reassures us that the experts who head up our system of government have everything well under control. It is, of course, an ideology of the professional class, of sound-minded East Coast strivers, fresh out of Princeton or Harvard, eagerly quoting as authorities their peers in the other professions, whether economists at MIT or analysts at Credit Suisse or political scientists at Brookings. Above all, this is an insider's ideology, a way of thinking that comes from a place of economic security and takes a view of the common people that is distinctly patrician. And that's it. That's it. That's exactly what that is. She offers the barest bones of economic relief to a suffering and increasingly impoverished population. And this is the one thing that she could say that will make them in the middle of this very fraught election against this right. threat of the yeah. brown shirts coming for everybody. No, that that's too much. She offered to help people buy a house. She yes. offered to do something yeah. about inflation. And, and this is the cardinal sin. She blamed business for right. some of our problems because that's who these people come from. That's who they identify with. This is this is what Taibbi has written about so much, how journalism used to be a very working class profession, how a lot of these guys worked their way up from the mailroom. And um, you can see that in the old movies, the way they would portray the reporters. They usually were not portrayed as these kind of George Will style professionals. They, uh, well, what are you saying, Mr. Mayor? Are you saying? Right. right. I mean, and I think that reflected a certain reality of the class that these reporters were often drawn from. Now these people are drawn from the same class as it, this is what Frank is describing. They're drawn from the same class as the analysts at MIT. Uh, they're, they're from the same class as the politicians that they're covering this, and they share that um, class perspective of a ruling class elite. Um, if you look at the way that they covered Sanders, I mean, that really just, for a lot of us, it was a very masks off moment. I know a lot of people were already there, but for millions of us, that was the they live glasses moment. Right. When we exactly. saw how these people covered Sanders, we realized because you would always kind of bought into the idea. We're all on the same page. We all want kind of, you know, Scandinavian style socialism. We just have to vote harder 
and there's an emerging demographic majority, and we got to bury these Republicans. And then you realize, no, they don't want that at all. Right. They don't want right. that at all. They, they, they'll they talk about wanting it because they know that makes them look virtuous. But in the face of the reality of it, they are more hostile towards ideas like that than to anything proposed by a Republican. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, by they, 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 we mean the liberal class journalists. And in this example, this was not they found some schmuck to submit an op-ed. The editorial right. board right. thought it right. necessary to make yep. a statement about this. I don't remember an editorial board finding it necessary to chime in on a fairly boilerplate policy speech. Like the editorial boards, they write on bit like when something big happens, they're like, OK, we as an outlet need to make our position known about this. That's why the New York Times editorial board calls on Biden to drop out like a, a big event is where you would gather the editorial board together to issue a statement. I've never seen an editorial board chime in on a fairly forgettable policy speech. They found it necessary to convene a meeting and make a statement as an outlet right. that this is unserious because she blames big business and excessive profits, whatever that means. Well, they did the same thing with Elizabeth Warren, who was very similar yeah. in proposing rather mild reforms to capitalism right. while uh, avowing her dedication to capitalism. Right. And what's what's really, really bizarre about this is come on, man. I mean, you're you you're you're professionals. You you know that this is all just a bunch of bullshit. You know that right. they're never passing any of better. this. Yeah, they know and it, she knows, you know, everybody knows they're not passing this. Please clap. Yeah.